So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to be here and speaking with us tonight. It'll be great to have different perspectives on this issue, and I do hope that we'll have a very interesting conversation over the next hour or two. Um, the format that I propose is for the first half, we'll have some direct questions to the panelists um, from me. Um, we'll start off kind of broad, and then we'll drill down a bit more as we go. Um, we'll probably only get about two or three questions each. Um, we'll try and stick to kind of three, four, five minutes answer per panelist, um, just for the sake of time. And then after that, we'll open a Q&A to the audience. Um, and we can start fielding questions from there. Um, I would just like to say that we did invite um, the Minister of State for Public Health, Wellbeing and National Drug Strategy, Frank Feehan, but he did not respond. So anyway, we'll get cracking. So I'm just going to go through and ask each of our panelists a specific question at the beginning. We're going to start off kind of broad, as I said, and then we'll get more specific. So based on your different backgrounds is where we'll start from. So Natalie, I'm wondering, would you be able to start us off by giving a brief overview of the kind of current drug policy and legal landscape in Ireland, um, particularly in relation to cannabis? And again, try to keep it to four or five minutes if possible. I know that's probably going to be an ask in and of itself. Thanks very much, guys. Well, I'm from Cork, so I can speak till the cows come home and it wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> But the basic uh, rundown of the law in Ireland is cannabis is illegal. It is a scheduled drug. So we don't have different classes of drugs. It's all just one big schedule, big long list of substances and chemicals. Uh, it's origins in the 1970, 1977 Misuse of Drugs Act. So a long, long time ago, it'll be nearly 50 years in 2027. So it's in place a long time. Um, if you're caught with cannabis, then it's a criminal offence. The punishments for cannabis do differ to other drugs in the schedule. There's specifically lesser punishment for possession of cannabis, uh, fines, small sentences, whereas other drugs have the straight custodial sentences. But realistically, a criminalised record is a criminal record, and it's like the Damocles sword hanging over your head once you get it. So regardless if it's a fine, if it's suspended sentence it's still a hefty sentence on somebody carrying it uh, it's illegal in terms of smuggling obviously uh, it's illegal in terms of medicine medical use only for a very limited set of circumstances which was mis ministerial license up till recently Gino Kenny knows all about the the MCAF I'm sure he'll speak about it better than I would and the same goes for Miriam so that's your basic cannabis law in Ireland Thank you very much. That was very well within the time. Um, <laughs> but just to ask maybe a little more specifically, because I know one of the big cases that came through the media recently was one of the former executives of Kyo's Crisps, um, Anthony Kyo, who was caught with a number of um, premature plants, you could call them. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, his sentence was very... Um, lenient, you could say, for someone who was caught with approximately eight or 9,000 euros worth of cannabis, compared to a shout out to Martin Condon, who raises these court cases sometimes through his um, podcast, Martin's World. But I've seen people, you know, going through the court system for five euros worth of cannabis. So is there any sort of, you know, baseline in terms of the court system? Or is it just kind of who you are and who you know? Yeah, it's there is no consistency to it whatever like you gave the example of Tony Kyo uh, walking out the doors of court but I think it was two days ago or yesterday uh, Martin Condon had it up as well a six-year-old woman who had a very small amount of cannabis for her arthritis got 60 days in jail like there's other people out there I know another six-year-old woman who got caught with it and no previous convictions very small amount 20 30 euros and she now has a suspended criminal sentence. So like there's a, another guy with four euros worth, like I can go on and on. And then they all have criminal convictions and then larger amounts will still get the same punishment or even a lesser punishment. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And like, there's no denying it. Justice is supposed to be blind, but we all know that it's not blind. It depends on wearing your suit or wearing an Adidas tracksuit. It depends whether you have an address on the north side or a south side. It depends if your face is known around the street or if your face isn't known. So unfortunately, justice is not blind in that regard. Mm. So currently, wild disparities within the court system and how it's dealt with. Completely. And like I personally, I'd love to do some sort of thesis on it, but the figures to obtain the figures, it's almost impossible because there is no uh, judgment. There's no judicial record of the lower court system. So often it's newspaper reports that you're working off of. Right. OK, well, you'd certainly be years trying to go back through all of those. But uh, thank you very much for, for that brief overview. Um, so now we'll move to Miriam. And as was previously mentioned, the MCAP system. I'm correct in saying you're one of the few people in the country who actually has an MCAP license, aren't you? No, so I have a ministerial license, so I wouldn't qualify for uh, to be on the MCAP because that's just three conditions. Okay. So I'm sure people are here are sick of saying. So um, I take medical or medicinal cannabis. My When I consume cannabis, my intent is medical for trying to decrease my migraines. And that's the real reason I have it. And, um, you know, it's very much kind of a domino effect on me that... I take cannabis to help sleep well, to decrease my migraines. That then allows me to play sport. And it's all this big demo effect. You feel well, you exercise more, you exercise more, you have less migraines. So um, I'm not, I, either way, I wouldn't qualify for the MCAP as things stand. Okay. And would you be able to just maybe briefly explain the differences between the two systems? Or if, you know, as yes. best you can. So, yeah, as best I got. Yeah. So uh, in Ireland at the moment, we have the medical cannabis medical cannabis access program that really was driven by Gino was on the call and Vera and Kenny and Martin as you mentioned a lot of people have kind of driven to push this forward probably the biggest name is Vera and what that's done is the government has brought in the medical cannabis access program for only three conditions so that is if you're suffering with cancer and you've tried every other drug if you have uh, epilepsy and you've tried every other drug and if you have MS and you've tried every other drug on the planet um, and then if none of the other drugs work and you have one of them three conditions and you get a consultant who wants to work with you, then maybe you'll get a license. And then when you get your uh, you get onto the medical cannabis access program, you know, you're going to be limited to a small number of products. At the moment, I think we only have one. You know, it's just that's not a medical cannabis access program. That's a farce. Nobody can ever answer why we have that particular medicine on the program. And um, so even if I got on the program, the, the, the canopel that they have at the moment, I have no interest in it either. Right? So right. what I have to do is I have to apply for a ministerial license. And that's where the majority of the patients are at the moment. So I work with my GP, which is the person I should be working with. I then have my consultant endorse it. We apply to the Department of Health and then we get what's called a ministerial license, which will allow my GP to prescribe, import and hold medical cannabis, basically. The problem with that system is number one, it's nearly impossible to get. I have a really strong relationship with my GP and my consultant who, by the way, has absolutely nothing to do with insomnia or migraines, but he's a consultant that can endorse it. And um, so we apply for a ministerial license. Once that's received, my, it's under my GP's name. My GP can then prescribe from a pharmacy within the EU. At the moment, we can only prescribe through Transval, which is a Dutch pharmacy. Transval only carry a limited number of products from one producer. So as I mentioned earlier with the medical cannabis access program, it's farcical that it only has one product. It's also farcical for the majority, well, sorry, not for the majority, for a small number of uh, patients on the ministerial license program that don't fall into damage epilepsy or don't have severe epilepsy. For somebody like myself that has migraine, insomnia, anxiety, I virus of oils of different methods of consumption basically what the ministerial license holder is stuck with is bedrican or bedrican or more bedrican um, and bedrican is a licensed producer out of holland so that system in itself offers no security what happens if bedrican is bought over what happens if bedrican change the oil that they're mixing with their uh, cannabinoids you know there's a million different things what happens if dhl stop delivering it's, it's an insane program at the moment, but I'm sure we're going to get into more details at the moment. So that's how I can legally access cannabis at the moment in Ireland. Um, and that's after spending eight years, uh, coming up to eight years since 2013. I was looking at my numbers. I've been traveling in and out of this country um, to feel well through uh, using cannabinoids. So 
Um, yeah, it feels a little bit at the moment back to the future that I've gone and worked in the legal space in Canada and then come back to Ireland and kind of, it, it feels like I've stepped back in time, you know, mm. so gone from having complete access to products to now one particular strain. It's only a flower strain out of Bedrican. Number one, I don't really smoke. So I'm normally someone that would consume through capsules, through topicals. Um, I'm a, I use concentrates as well, so I press my cannabis into concentrates. So to have to go back to smoking cannabis for a year and a half now since I came home during COVID, it makes no sense. And it's, it, it's absolutely nothing to do with public health anyway. Mm. Okay. So sorry, a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, yeah. Well, no, thank you very much. That was that was really uh, interesting explanation. And we'll definitely come back. I want to speak to you a bit more about the Canadian systems and maybe some of the differences that you see yep. from there. Because certainly it sounds extremely limited. Like you either have a choice of do you want it or don't you, by the sounds of it. Yeah. And that's if you get that point, yeah. you know, if you get to that point. And then if you have a good, yeah. And it's all about the relationship with your GP and consultants. The only difference between me and tens of thousands of other people is that I have a GP who supports me and a consultant who supports me. And that's the only difference. I don't have an arm falling off. I don't have a leg falling off. I just have a GP who's concerned about my well-being. Yeah. And even at the moment, I know it's hard enough to find a GP, never mind if they're good or bad, just to get one. But anyway, yep. we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, thank you very much, though. Um, so I'll move on to Gino. Um, Gino, if you wouldn't mind explaining your party's position on cannabis and your upcoming bill. On which I believe is the Cannabis Regulation and Control Bill. Am I correct in saying that? Correct, correct, Ben. And hopefully, um, we'll have a first draft of the bill in the next six weeks, and I hope to introduce it before Christmas. That's right. the, the idea. Uh, it's kind of out of our hands slightly. Uh, it's been, you know, but it's been drafted at the moment. Um, and obviously, what we want to do is to challenge the very, very outdated laws in relation to cannabis. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, uh, cannabis needs to be regulated and controlled. We have the opposite in this country. Um, and that opposite is causing all sorts of um, problems in communities. Because uh, once there's, um, a, a, I would just say, a void and a vacuum, people will fill that vacuum. And that's usually the black market, i.e. sometimes, well, not some criminality, right? And they draw in all sorts of people, all sorts of people. Um, and criminalizing people for the use of cannabis is completely antiquated. Uh, it's unjust and needs to stop. Um, because the, the laws kind of copper fasten that are completely outdated. Out, completely outdated. And criminalizing people for uh, cultivation of cannabis, uh, the use of cannabis, again, is, is outdated. So we have to look at a different model. And that model, I believe, is legalization. is uh, regulated, uh, controlling it uh, via kind of dispensaries. You know, people can grow certain amount of plants and so forth. So a model like other countries have done. And the, skull's not, the sky is not going to fall apart. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, what we've seen in different jurisdictions, uh, there, there's a revenue take from it. Uh, you, you take it from the black market, you control it. You, if you want to consume cannabis, that's up to you. Uh, you know exactly what's in it. You know, the CBD, THC uh, contents in it. So it's very civilized, right? But, you know, there's, you know, there's certain kind of um, elements in, I would say, not in society, well, in society as well, but in the doll, that is, they're Jurassic, literally Jurassic, the way they think uh, in relation to, um, drug use and we got to kind of change that and we got to change the narrative that cannabis is somehow the root of all evil because um, it's not and it's been demonized for centuries decades it's been politicized all sorts that comes with it so we need to change that narrative and the best way to do it um, uh, is to ch challenge the law that's in here uh, but also you need a movement of people um, outside the gates of Lenza House, and I think there's, I think there's a groundswell of people out there. Uh, no, because you know, it. This is it's academic whether you use cannabis or not, right? This are it's about is the kind of present laws um, working in relation to civic society in relation to the resources that it's put in uh, to 
stop people using cannabis because that's basically what the law the law is about stopping people using cannabis that doesn't that doesn't work uh controlling cannabis as a controlled substance i tell you anybody that can s- sit there and say with a straight face that i'm um, laws well they're just kidding you so all to me it just doesn't work you need a new narrative you need to go beyond decriminalization uh, you need to kind of you have a model of regulation uh, because uh, as i said th- at the moment uh the laws just don't they don't fit the 24th century and people will use cannabis whether it's legal or not so in that guise uh, take control back off uh, criminal gangs regulate it tax it uh, and, and adults can make uh, proper choices uh, there's better outcomes for everybody uh, and harm reduction yeah we can we can address that uh, but you need control because there's no control once you don't have control you have nothing so we need to best control back not only from the dinosaurs sometimes in here uh, and but you need to um, invest uh, kind of control from the criminality that comes involved because it's very 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 serious what's happening in communities it's drawing in huge amounts of young people um into very very hard it's more kind of more dangerous drugs than cannabis will ever be um so look at i'm quite passionate about this issue um and i think we need to change the narrative change the law and uh, let's get cracking Brilliant. Cheers for that overview. It was very good, Gino. Right. And finally, Nessa, if you wouldn't mind outlining the Green Party position on cannabis, and then I know you're working um, in the background towards getting the Citizens Assembly on matters relating to drug use um, announced at least, but maybe, I don't know if you have any updates or even just to explain to people, you know, what, what might be coming out of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Green Party have an official policy of decriminalisation that includes um, cannabis cafes and a model similar to some of the European countries where you can own a certain amount. Um, and I personally, I, I, I would be in favour of, of legalisation, I have to be honest. And I totally agree with Gino, actually, that I have to say, when you start talking about this stuff in the media, you often get asked, you know, what well, are, are you a user? And I always think, well, that's completely irrelevant because I think my interest here is around the impact that this is having on people's lives and people on society and the great damage that we're doing. Um, and I think that, um, as you said, like, y- y- you know, we, I am working away in the background. Obviously, we don't uh, agree with our coalition partners on this issue. Um, And I think, you know, just to go through like some of the challenges there, um, you know, uh, like there is a lot of resistance. I have to say, I think that before I kind of came into the doll, I must have lived in a little bit of a bubble because I did, notwithstanding my parents, for example, but like I I did mostly talk to people who recognize that we kind of live in a new era of um you know there's the globally there's a, a new conversation around cannabis and and there's a recognition that some people uh, it really enhances their lives because of maybe chronic pain or for what or for whatever you know um illness they're they're dealing with but also that um when we look at let's say the impacts of things, something like alcohol or other drugs that are freely available the contextual situation that we find ourselves with in with cannabis and the impacts of criminalization the impacts of allowing criminal gangs to run it the impacts of having like really unregulated products that have very high levels of things that you know can hurt people the impact of that is really questionable you know in the way that we're controlling it so I did, I think, I live in a bubble. And then I came in here and I realized that whatever resistance I encountered, let's say in the government negotiations, which you would be expecting, I I would expect to, and to be honest with you, the Citizens Assembly was our way of, you know, kind of um, maneuvering around the issue and trying to get something progressive that we could work on. Um, I have to say the resistance is more than I was expecting. I think that I would completely agree with Gino is that there is a sense a pervasive sense that uh, cannabis is like this big, scary gateway drug, and that if we, if we, you know, loosen the reins here, um, it'll loosen the reins everywhere, and it'll kind of be Sodom and Gomorrah. And I have to say, when you balance that, then with as I said, the impacts of of our current law, 
like we really need to have a, a proper debate about it. I do think that there's a few other bits around, um, uh, you know, the people that we hear talking in the media, particularly from the medical community, are often the people who don't support um, kind of more legalization or, or more um, relaxing of the rules. I think that doesn't help. Um, and I think that, you know, our suggestion of the Citizens Assembly was an attempt to change that conversation because we have seen Citizens Assemblies take issues that um, are complex socially and that possibly because of the way our vote, voting system works you're more likely to vote if you're older you're more likely to vote if you own a house or you own a car that means that the doll is skewed towards um maybe kind of more traditional views and it was a way of reframing that and having a conversation because i do think when you see things like gino's bill coming through which will will you know and you can that will change the, the context and will allow people a chance to discuss this in 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 real seriousness um you you do see that it can change uh uh the horizon of what we're talking about and we saw it with dignity uh dying with dignity you know like it is possible change is possible you can sometimes move the dial but i do think it's going to be one of those issues that we have to have lots of very granular discussions with everybody about and try and bring them forward and in terms of an update the last update I got, I, I got was that it would be in spring 2022 at the same time as the Biodiversity Climate Assembly um, or Citizens Assembly on Biodiversity. Um, now, I haven't had any new information since that, and I'm I'm going to hold them to that. And I've, I've actually this week went back to them and said, is that still the um, the the schedule? I'm hoping it is. I never I ne until something is like done or right in front of my hands just it's the nature of the coalition that I don't quite I would want to say I don't trust people but I am naturally cynical <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't like to kind of give people an absolute on that but what I would say is that I have had a discussion with the minister uh, uh, Minister Fien and although he absolutely is not and I don't think he's made any um, bones about this that he, he's not you know hugely keen on this area himself the recognition was that it's in the program for government and we won the citizens assembly in the negotiations and therefore that will that will be honored so that that's the only update I have I guess okay well thank you very much for that it was a very good overview um yeah, I think it is interesting. I came across recently a 2006 Oroctus report in which the minister is actually one of the, the signatories or was involved in the drafting of it. And it basically says cannabis is a gateway drug. It will lead to heroin use, yada, yada, yada. So I certainly as an individual don't have much confidence in the minister to, to move this along. But that's beside the point. Um, so coming back around, second round of questions. Um, Natalie, I'm wondering if you have done any work possibly around policing and enforcement, or if you know of maybe different systems in which they handle it much better, because I know we're, we're very slowly changing how that system is in Ireland, where, you know, the first time you're caught, depending on the guards, you might get away with a caution. And I think they recently announced there's a, a kind of a, a two strike system now. Um, I don't know if you might know a bit more about this and potentially could explain to us if you do. Well, the, what you're on about is the adult caution scheme that was announced end of 2019, start of 2020. Um, and it's still not implemented. I think there's 700,000 euros going towards implementing it. So what is going to happen, like first time you get caught now, whether you're 18 or 80, if you get caught in possession, it's there is no legal mandate of discretion. There's no legislation there to allow guarded discretion. Now it can be used, it cannot be used. <clears throat> that's something that's going unreported. But the adult caution scheme that's going to be implemented, although it is a step, it is a baby learning how to walk tiny toddler step. It's terrible <laughs> it's a terrible idea but at least it's something so what they're going to try and do bring in is the first time that you get caught in possession of drugs you are automatically mandatory referred to the hse for an intervention and a screening if you require any assistance any services etc the second time you're caught it is up to the guards discretion whether he allows you a second hse intervention or briefing or he chooses to criminalize you. 
the third time you're caught, there is no choice. You're criminalized. End of. So it's a three strike rule, basically. But I think although it is a step forward, it is too small. It's not enough. And it's almost laughable. Like what we have now is the first time you're caught with any drugs, whether it's cannabis or not, if in terms of this conversation, cannabis, you're caught, you're mandatory referred to the HSE for an intervention and a briefing. It sends out an automatic signal to society, you're an addict and you have a problem. So if Miriam didn't have her license and was forced to rely on the black market, she is now sent to drug addiction services and to the HSE for a screening. I mean, which, what are we labeling them, a criminal or an addict? I mean, you're just swapping one negative stigmatizing label for another. Um, the second time, guarded discretion, as I've said before, justice is not blind. That discretion is only going to happen in some cases and not all. And then the third time, you're automatically criminalized. What's the point in the first two times if you're going to end up getting criminalized in the, at the end of it anyway? I mean, the people who are going to get caught multiple times are the people who are most visible in society, which is your homeless and your vulnerable. The people who already have societal issues. And you're just going to criminalize them further. I mean, the whole point of not criminalizing is to intervene. But if you're going to intervene in the wrong way, then what's the point of the intervention in the first place? You're just adding to everything that's wrong with the system as it is. So there is other options like you have Portugal. They have introduced decriminalization in 20, 2000, so 21 years. And it was the experiment and they were waiting for the sky to fall and the world to end and Portugal to be turned absolutely upside down by decriminalization and none of it has happened. Like their, their drug debts, their harm from drugs has dropped. They have had the biggest improvement. Their prison population has gone down tremendously. Alongside decriminalization, they also invested very, very heavily in the social services that's needed and wraparound services that are located where they're needed, not centralized services, everything is up in Dublin. Everything is in the city. It's only open nine to five, Monday to Friday. Like we're not talking about Irish services, <laughs> proper wraparound services that are located where they need them. And they have had amazing results. It's not the perfect model. There's still issues. Drugs are still illegal. They're still sold on the streets. You're still buying them off the black market. So it is not the, the silver bullet to solve the situation, but just by stop criminalizing people, they've made tremendous improvements. I come in there just really quick I I we got a briefing I, I I can't remember do you know if you if um you were at that one but I have significant concerns around that whole program because there's as I understand the briefing that we got like there's very little there's so much discretion and like I can imagine you know just in my constituency like I'm in Cabra the lads in Cabra are not going to get the same level of discretion as some young people have picked up in class 11. It's just not going to happen. And uh, I think that, as it was explained to me, is there's very little guidance given on quantity and type. So you could have like huge discrepancies between like someone then, you know, in one part of the city could have you know a brick of something fairly substantial and get discretion and somebody else could have like a little plant of their own and get noticed like it's it, it just affords a level of discretion that I'm uncomfortable with it's not set down in policy and it's not set down in guidelines and that is the dangerous thing I mean we've seen recently the headlines for the guards and what has been happening I for one would not have very much confidence in the guards discretion based on their track record and we've seen it ourselves, as you said, in Cabra and Glasnevin and Black Rock and Docky are going to get completely treated completely different. So it, if it is going to be implemented, it needs to be implemented right. Don't do this halfway house of three strikes. I mean, you're, you're trying to avoid the criminal justice system, not prolong the agony by having three strike, strikes. I mean, there, it, there's some serious guidelines needs to be put down for this if it's going to be any way successful. And I, I'm coming to the point that I'm actually thinking that they're they're bringing in all these things to make it look like they're trying to be progressive but realistically actually they, changing want to make it, they want to make it as bad of a program as they can or make it fail similar to the MCAP you know here we offered it to you we tried look it's not working can we just go back to not doing it yeah hmm. thank you very much for that that was very interesting um I do think discretion it's always, it's just wide open to abuse. 
it doesn't matter where it is. Like if it's discretion and it's kind of a hush hush system, it's never really going to work. It's just going to be wide open for abuse. But anyway, moving on. Miriam, coming back to the Canadian system, and maybe you can draw some parallels between between that and here. Um, but their system changed relatively recently. And you were you there, kind of to see before and after. Yeah, um, and just quickly to go back to your earlier point, like when you look at countries that have fully legalized and they're a mature society, and I find numbers that are never showed in Ireland, you know, you look across the Canada, 97% of cannabis users in Canada, recreationally or medically, never seek out any help, you know, when the surveys and all, all any of the stats that I give tonight are all from Health Canada, so they can all be confirmed, but 97% of people don't need help. And then you look at the Irish stats and they're all completely skewed because you're going up in front of a judge. And I can tell you, if I get caught with that and I travel around the world, you can bet your bottom dollar I'll go on any course available so that I can continue to mountain bike across the world and go on all my hiking trips, you know. So just so people are aware, they 97% are all good. And um, so it's very, yeah, moving back to Canada uh, really quick then. So I initially went to America in 2013, I had this life changing journey between. April and October where it completely came off opiates, long story, uh, and it really helped with my migraines. Came home in November, realized things had uh, changed for me, and I moved to Vancouver in April 2014. So I was there pre-legalization, and basically pre-legalization in Canada, and you know, I hear sometimes from say the Cannabis Risk, Risk Alliance, let's see how they get on in a few years. Cannabis has pretty much been legal in Canada since 91 and in California. So you could get, I went over in 2014, I didn't even have to blink to get a license, there was no issue. So it's it's been completely embedded into society in Canada. All that's happened in 2018 is that it's gone fully legal on the recreational front. Um, and it's basically the government has said that, you know, do you want to keep cannabis out of the reach of youth? And do you want to protect public health and safety by allowing adults access to safe legal cannabis? And it's about keeping it out of the hands of criminals. So it's this choice of what we want to do. And, with Gino's bill coming forward, it's so key that we come together on this. And there's, you know, I'm sorry that Nessa heard that there's certain that there was medical patients not as keen at recreation. And I think the problem with that is that they're just not aware of what the industry is, of like the beast of what the industry is. And they don't realize that full legalization actually secures medicine for me, for them, for everybody. Because at the moment, it's just, it's not viable for a company to come into Ireland and supply 10 patients. It's just not going to happen. It has to be complete legalization. And if you also only go medical versus rec, you're still going to be in this loophole of your uncle getting a license and giving you a little bit of weed off his medical license. You're going to go in circles. And that was the problems that they saw in Canada. It pretty much was legal. All they've done now is tax it regulated, educated. And that was how I first stepped into the industry as an educator, is that it was for cannabis for harm reduction. Because I had had such a kind of change in my life with access to cannabis, I realized it wasn't this big taboo that they tell us, you're not going to end up going taking heroin four days later. You know, it's not a gateway drug. And all that, uh, when you start Googling it, and I always say this even to my relatives, I joke around at the dinner table, if I could just get people to research cannabis, to go on their phone for half an hour, they'll come on board on what we're saying. And it's just about killing people with facts, you know, that when we hear this information of people are getting treatment and the numbers are going up in Ireland, it's never, it's very disingenuous not to add, well, X percentage are up in court. Let's look at the data from across the world. Well, we know 97% are not need any treatment, only 2% do. But well, let's look at what happened to the youth when they fully legalized cannabis. Well, we know between 15 and 17 year olds, it's decreased by 50%. Let's look at the data when, when youth were using it before high school or secondary school in Ireland. So the number used to be at 59% were consuming before school of regular cannabis users. So you had a small percentage who were consuming pre-legalization in secondary school. You then looked at that number now in 2019 and there's a much bigger gap. There's nearly a 20% gap, a drop in people consuming before school. So all the facts and all the numbers are on our side for full legalization. It's now just kind of getting the groups together, both medical and legal, and pushing forward. And I can only encourage people to see that, like, the horse is bolted. Cannabis 
is legal. It's going to be legal. And, um, you know, it's disappointing to hear there is such dinosaurs uh, in, you know, in Ardal at the moment, because I all I look at now, like when I went to work in Canada, I was working only on the recreation or the adult use side. I had no interest in the medical side, to be honest, because you can't make any claims. So all you're really saying to the doctors when you are going in pitching is, you know, is it irradiated? What are the contraindicators? Whereas on the recreational side, you know, you have experts then. Then now you're looking at, well, what, what type what type medium is the cannabis grown in? Indoor, outdoor? What type pesticides are you using on the plant? How long was the cure? How long did you dry it for? Did you wet trim it? Did you dry trim it? What's the lineage of the plant? Did the grower play music to the plant? Whatever, whatever happens in this legalization, whatever way it comes, whether it's medical or recreational, it's going to come down to price and it's going to come down to quality. And really quality is going to come ahead of us. And, you know, if, for me and my experience, if the Irish government would just let me grow, you'll never hear from me again. Like, you know, I've gone from somebody who's, you know, working, most people in my life wouldn't even know anything about cannabis to now having to come on talks. And the idea of having to sell our souls to just get a license feels absolutely insane. It has to be full legalization because not everybody feels comfortable going to a doctor as well. We need to be aware of that. that not everybody needs to go to a doctor. We're grown adults. It's part of moving Ireland forward as well in the maturity level to take the taboo away from cannabis and to be able to educate people correctly on it, you know. So that was kind of one of the best things for me to see in Canada is be able to actually educate people um, about the different cannabinoids and about all the different methods of consumption as well. And that will allow that to come in. We'll kind of move away from the stereotype of the big blunt to, you know what, I use a vape and I use it from hydrocarbon extraction or do you know what? I only I only consume organically grown, non-irradiated cannabis grown in living soil. You know, so everyone's going to have this is just a huge beast. And I just I can't I'm trying to get that across how big this is, but it's already bolted, you know, and I just urged, you know, Anessa to keep pushing that, you know, we're talking about legalization, whereas we should be talking about regulations to keep foreign companies from growing in Ireland, like any cannabis companies coming up in Ireland. You know, your competition is an in-house, your competition is Circle K, you know, so this is, this is big and it's already there, you know, so we're just catching up. Whatever happens, we're catching up. If we legalize tomorrow, we're catching up, you know. Very true. Thank you very much for that overview. That was super interesting. There's so many different things you could delve into and just talk about those for 10, 15, 20, half an hour. And I imagine that's what you do in the regular. (laughs) Yeah, and we haven't even dipped in the right to grow a home, which has to be at the absolute foundation, you know, Absolutely. like, because this isn't regulated in Ireland, we can do something really special, like we can, in theory, create a not for profit industry, where the retail and the for profit adult use, that tax feeds into the medical side that can fund the medical patients, we can do what we want with this, you know, but let's keep it Irish and let's really, you know, support our patients. Absolutely. And I do think there is a very interesting you know, when people talk about like the Dutch model, the Portuguese model, the Canadian, like all of these things are inherently different based on where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying we should adopt the Dutch model, we should be saying, you know, how can we make an Irish model? So I totally agree with you there. Yeah, 100% agree with you there. And and just two things to mention from Canada. Number one, um, your prescription isn't covered whether you're getting cannabis or Xanax. And number two, the government actually runs the distribution. So it, you can't, it, you know, we're comparing apples and oranges. It's a different system. Like unless the government are going to set up a whole distribution system, you know, we, that's probably not going to happen. So it's like you said, right? It's taking the best from every country. It's are we going to have our retail score uh, stores grow in the back? But we know one thing we want to do. It always comes back to safety, quality, and price. So that be, you know, that means local grows. There's no way away from that. It has to be grown in Ireland for that quality to be there or you're going to just continue to have black markets forever, you know? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Um, Maybe following on from that, Gino, within your bill, I know you're saying it's going through the drafting process now, but is there maybe some core tenants that you could share with us as as to some of the things that you really want to see underpinning a regulation system in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, I think the main kind of points uh, of the new bill will be uh, rescheduling of cannabis. So at the moment, it's it's one. So that needs to be rescheduled. 
Um, which is the obvious. It needs to be <laughs> legalised. Uh, which is very, very obvious. Uh, it needs to be uh, regulated, which is quite obvious. Uh, it needs to be controlled, and uh, that that control can come in kind of the way I would see it is from the state, um, and that could be a number of bodies, uh, civic bodies, in relation to that. Um, and then how people uh, consume cannabis or obtain it. So there's a number of models around the world where you can, you know, consume cannabis or obtain it, and that would be state dispensaries. Uh, that's um, a coffee shops, for Nessa has said, uh, and also people can grow a certain amount of plants, a number of plants in their own home. Um, so that's the kind of mechanism uh, I would see in the bill, the main kind of point of the bill, um, and. You know, it should be an industry that's indigenous, if possible, if possible, uh, uh, because obviously if, if it was regulated tomorrow and legalized tomorrow, I mean, there would be a big demand. No, but there'd be a demand for cannabis, like, you know, and most people would go away from the black market and go down and buy, you know, wherever, like, the, the, you know, um, like, wherever the cannabis they wanted and consume it, whether there or at home. And... Uh, you know, that's a, it's, it's relatively straightforward when you put that kind of mechanism together. Uh, now, it's obviously, you know, to do that, you have to change the law and so forth. Uh, and that could be a bigger task. Um, but when that mechanism comes together, um, that can challenge the kind of the take people away from the black market um, and having to, you know, buy cannabis uh, from people they don't even know. Um, and it could be laced with anything, literally anything. Uh, so then it's regulated, and then people can make informed cho choices. They're adults. Uh, because consuming, consuming cannabis is nobody's business but the person. What is everybody's business is how it's actually uh, kind of uh, not, not regulated at the moment. That's everybody's business. Um, and that's very, very serious, as I said. It is... It is um, it is fueling uh, in certain communities um, huge amount of kind of intimidation, uh, and there's, it, it, it fuels a lot of uh, the alternative economy. There's huge money to be made in it. Like I don't know about you, but every single day uh, the seizures made of cannabis. Even you know every single day, uh, the police put up. They found fifty thousand, hundred thousand. So the demand for cannabis uh, is is biggest ever, you know, um, and that demand is not going to kind of subside by any means, uh, regardless of if they put police on every single street in this country, it's still, there'll still be a demand. So putting all them resources in to jailing people, think about it, uh, there's a huge amount of money that goes into putting people in prison, and uh, all the resources that the police, uh, the courts take up in relation to cannabis use, um, so there has to be something different. Um, and that's what we're trying to do as, as lawmakers is to change uh, a very, very antiquated and outdated law because at the moment, I mean, public attitudes, um, I think, have changed in Ireland. There's been a social revolution in the last 15 years. Things that were almost uh, unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable that would change in Ireland have, right? Now, attitudes to drug, uh, drugs are changing as well. They're ahead of politicians. Um, and, I mean, it's quite, it's a nuanced uh, kind of, uh, you know, question to ask people. Would you um, agree with a regulated system of cannabis where people make informed choices where it's controlled? If you put all of them on the table, I guarantee you the majority of people in Ireland would support the system of regulation rather than what we have at the moment. I, I guarantee you, when it's put in a rather, not a kind of hysterical way, if it's put in in a kind of uh, informed way, if it's put in a kind of um, uh, structured way, um, I think the majority of people would say, look, I think that system that they have in that, that country is a better system than we have now for harm reduction uh, and all that comes with it. So, that's the, that's the alternative, the binary choice to me. It's a binary choice, whether if you want to keep the system that's 
at the moment that doesn't work or a system that is, you know, is better than the system that it is now. And it does work. It does work. It's not perfect. Nothing is perfect in this, in this world. Nothing is perfect. Um, so if you seek perfection, you won't, you, won't, you won't get anywhere. We're trying to do something that has been done in other countries uh, and it's been shown that it works better. The outcomes are better for everybody. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, I think I can hear myself coming through now, your, your speakers, Gino, for some reason. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, anyway, thank you very much. Probably both this office. <laughs> Could well be, you never know. Yeah. Behind the flag, it's a. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have to, have to check. Testing one, two, three. Testing. Um, but yes, thank you very much. That was that was interesting. Um, I'd love to really drill down into you know all the different types of models and things, but we definitely just don't have the time tonight. But nonetheless, I think it's great that more and more of these conversations are happening. Like you're starting to see more and more people speaking about this, and you always like in the wider kind of zeitgeist or society, you always see this happening where conversations start to grow a little more and more. You start to hear about it more in mainstream media, the odd time, so on, so on. But as you're, you're dead right, like it's always, you know, society dragging the politics along. Um, but nonetheless, that's case in point for, for nearly every issue. But maybe moving on from that, um, Nessa, I'm just wondering, would you, you know, without spilling government secrets, maybe, or you can if you want, um, give us maybe a bit of an idea potentially within the politics of the coalition and within the civil service maybe as well because i know like the civil service do hold a lot of sway over these kind of macro decisions and policy um and obviously you know fina gael fina fall have been in government for decades and they would be a lot closer with a lot of these senior civil servants than a lot of other parties would be so how can people you know make a bit more of a change or where do you see these blocking points within the policy and politics side well as i said there, there's a lot of kind of traditional resistance to the whole issue but I have been surprised at the level of um, systemic resistance, like within the permanent government, the civil service. Um, and I think anybody who's watched the MCAP thing unfold, and obviously Gino is way more up on this and, and has followed it, you know, a lot longer than I have. But uh, I have been incredibly frustrated by the MCAP. Just, I feel that, and I, I think, I don't know if it was Miriam or, or Natalie said that, you, you know, in some ways, some of the stuff that we're seeing coming through now, almost feels like they'll, it'll be a barrier in itself, even though it feels like progress in, in one way, something done badly can act as a barrier. And I, I really feel like the MCAP is a good example of um, the full weight of the. So first of all, like that legend or that, that go ahead was given, I think 2016. And we here we are in 2021 and we're really only seeing the fledgling part of it um, come through now and the amount of products is laughable that are available to people and is anyone particularly like because it'll deal with people who have epilepsy for example or, or a number of different conditions as anyone who's gone through that process with a loved one or themselves knows you often have to go through a number of products that say they do the same thing but they just don't necessarily agree with people in the same way and so the fact that we've ended up with a system where we only have like really one or two products available is completely unacceptable. Um, and I do think that it's a, it, like it's a model for how the civil service can use bureaucracy and things like procurement to, to basically stifle progress. Um, and I think and I, I have said that publicly and, and I, I said that to them. I, I just think that, that that's not um like it's it, 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 that's not fair you know, like they're, they're in a really kind of dumb simplistic way that's not fair what they're doing and I, and I think that there is a real resistance in 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 the civil service against um progressing this because again of that idea that it's like this scary uh gateway thing I think the way and and I, that does really um copper fasten the level of resistance in government in general because it's one thing for example like like take the safe access zones right you know there was a number of people in government who did want that and even though the system like the guardy and 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 civil servants were saying no we don't need legislation there there's a little bit of political will that can push it through 
I'm, I'm not, and I would agree with you, is not being um, overly hopeful around the level of political will. I'm just saying that that's different from an agreement in the, in the programme for government, and, and we got it and we're getting it. Um, but I would agree that like that really doubles down on the difficulty. Um, but I, I think personally the way around that is a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, it's to kind of unpick all of, of the that bureaucratic heft as you go along. So for example, during that MCAP stuff, they're very keen on saying, well, we're co copying the Danish you, you know, model and, and doing what they did. And of course that's not the case at all. Cause when you go back and look at Denmark, they're doing things like, bring, as, as Miriam said, they're doing things like bringing in um, domestic production. Um, and that's, you know, like it's worth going back through the detail and saying, no, that's not exactly right. And, and plugging away at that because, you know, uh it, it is kind of granular stuff of unpicking all of all of the the kind of rubbish that you get fed and you're expected to just accept um but i, I do think actually and and again it's that thing uh, as was mentioned before around safety quality and price i think actually to move the discussion along we should move the discussion along like we should start talking about you know who wants to smoke recreational cannabis i think we should be talking about it in terms of we want an industry here. Here's how we're going to build this industry. Is it cooperative? Is it, you know, like let's move, let's generationally move the conversation along so that we're we're taken more seriously around like who's going to produce this product? How do we make sure it's safe? You know, how, how is it going to be doled out? Is this in pharmacies? Is this in Tesco? Is this in your local Circle K? Um, and I think we need to ha start having those much more complicated and detailed conversations and asking them to have those conversations because now you're not into the ideology of it similar to the, the whole repeal thing let's let's do the kind of deep dive you're not into the ide ideology of do you like cannabis or not now you're into well if we were going to make this work how are we going to make this work and i i think that is a way to kind of you, you know use their own rhetoric you know, to, to push it over the line, and make it possible, make it possible in their in their own mind frame or in sorry, in their own mindset um, that, that this could happen. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do, but I do think that, as you say, you, we will reach a tipping point if if we continue to have public meetings and you continue you know, and bills do come through and the citizens assembly goes ahead. Um, and hopefully there'll be more and more data and, and good stuff that we can point to and research. That we will reach a tipping point where it'll be hard to argue otherwise and i think that that that's the way to do it i i think there's plenty of stuff that's going to happen and is happening in the in 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 like last year this year and in the coming years uh i mean you saw the big rows about her, um, <laughs> farming in the doll today like there are things that are going to happen uh in a number of spheres in our society that probably don't have the full support of you know a majority in the coalition but they're an agreed thing and they're going to happen um but i would just counter that you know not everything in those agreements does get pushed over the line and it takes somebody nagging and going on and on and on about it and that's not me necessarily that's like everybody that's civil society that's ngos that's opposition that's coalition partners that's backbenchers everybody just nagging and going on about it all the time and and that's the way you you, you push people over the edge can i jump in there and just uh, pick up on what you're saying about political will and irish homegrown business and a homegrown industry like the majority of cannabis activists in ireland want a homegrown industry we want to grow your own the social clubs cooperative model and like it is an opportunity to make a a known irish product we're famous for our irish butter irish sausages why not add in irish cannabis as well would it like we can see the lack of political will in terms of CBD in the hemp in industry in the government. I mean, we have people in court for possession of CBD because it's organic CBD and it's not synthetic CBD. And that is purely the, re the base reason behind it. Now, Miriam knows more about science than I will. I'll stick to law. But the, we have people that are going to, into courts for possession of CBD. We have farmers that are throw, that having to destroy their crops because they can only use the stalk and the stem. I mean, like we have a homegrown Irish businesses. There is many businesses out there flourishing in the CBD industry and they're subjected to raids. They're subjected to criminalization. There is high court proceedings. It's costing a lot of money for people who are just trying to have an Irish homegrown business and they're getting targeted 
they're getting raided, they're getting their businesses ruined. So the the Irish industry that's there has fought already through teeth and nail to get where they are, and they are just becoming more and more successful in the industry. There's no even support from the government to foster that. It's grown out of nothing. It's the phoenix from the ashes, basically. And they're still trying to destroy it. So there is absolutely no political will. They're trying to destroy what Irish industry is there as it is. I'd, I'd question the desire if we're ever going to get them to care about an Irish industry in cannabis. I would okay. too. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that, that I, I like, uh, as I said, I don't think the political will is there. No. Um, and I, I know I always kind of think like we're always um, arguing that the reason we have so much livestock is because it's so great to grow grass here and people can go out faster. Well, I mean, why aren't we growing more hemp then? It doesn't make any sense. Miriam will probably have all the answers to the soil and the plant and all the different science behind it. Yeah, well, I just, you know, I know I said at the start, it does feel like I'm in the Back to the Future movie because this this beast has left, you know, recreational legal cannabis is bolted. It's out there, like three of the brands I work for, Whistler Medical, uh, San Rafael. You know, San Rafael, just to think of the branding behind that, San Rafael is the town that 420 was started. So anyone knows the time 420, where a bunch of friends met up at 420. That actually hadn't happened in the town of San Rafael. So they weren't able to trademark 420, but we trademarked it to San Rafael. You know, it's just to give an idea of this is truly like gone. You know, you look to California, the cookies brands. I, I walk around Dublin and I see Californian cannabis brands and hoodies on your on guys and girls around you know we really do need to start moving this conversation forward on what this can be and let's start off have it indigenous have it just with ireland because when you're in canada you can't import so they're looking after themselves they're looking across the way at all of us and import and exporting over to ireland and europe and germany and you know and they're celebrated and they do their news releases for their stock share price they're drooling looking at Ireland and Europe because we have the social welfare we have the medical cards that they can overcharge for their medical products but they're also gazing in with their brands that are already established ready to go be as if alcohol as if we had no alcohol in Ireland and we'd look across the way and see Budweiser ready to rock into Ireland you know and we're, we're standing here arguing about you know about you know about non-alcoholic or will we allow alcoholic or non-alcoholic cannabis like it's just so off the wall. And when, and that's what you mentioned as well, like we got to keep nagging and keep going. I guess I'd ask yourself and Gino, like, where does that go? Like, does, does that include having to sell your soul to the papers? Which, you know, I think a lot of us have watched fear in March from Cork to Dublin. And I can only speak for myself. I found that really upsetting to the point that I was like, well, what am I going to do with my little insomnia and my migraines if a woman can't even be given the dignity to support her child like what type of society have we got in Ireland and I think that I think in the doll they need to step back and really look at that and look at how we are handling society at the moment because watching Vera for me that just gave me a plane ticket to Canada because what am I going to do I don't even want to live in a country that treats a parent like that you know and still to this date it's treating her and other parents disgustingly you know, and not guaranteeing their medicine. And that's what this full legalization will bring to. It will guarantee that that will guarantee that medicine in Ireland because don't be fooled into thinking it can only be Bedrican. Well, you can probably license that strain with enough money to sell, sell you the genetics as a lot of companies are already doing. Or we can create a very similar cultivar with similar terpenes, similar flavonoids, similar cannabinoid makeup. And we just grow it in Ireland. Because who says maybe there's another strain that can help even more, but we don't know because at the moment we're all limited. We're either limited to about three or four strains or it's off to the black markets. So, um, yeah, I couldn't, I just, I couldn't, uh, I just would ask like, where, where do we go? You know, I've emailed all the politicians. I have complained to the HPRA that the product quality coming from Bedrican is not good enough. They said to contact the Department of Health. The Department of Health tell me it's between me and my clinician. So what do I do? But I'd, I'd like to say who did register it, the Dutch Department of Health has registered my complaint. So it kind of upsets me because I really want to live in Ireland. But like, you know, we're living in a backward society at the moment where 
I even find that, you know, it's offensive at times, like to be thought of as a criminal or to be thought of as, you know, some type of drug addict, like, you know, just I'm a successful person, you know? So yeah, it's just, we need to move mountains. I just think that like, and I don't mean to push back that. Yeah, of course we need to niggle, but I just think there needs to be a realization that we need to move mountains here rather than hills kind of. You know, I don't know if you want to come in there, but just on the issue of like, I don't know how to say this in a way that it, the reality is, is that what I see in my political life every day is people having to trot out their story of personal pain to highlight yeah. an issue. And I wish it wasn't the case, but it, I would be lying if I said that wasn't the case. And I, um, like I, you hear it like on calls and there's people in tears and there's people outside the doll. And I think that um, as, as un terrible and unfair as that is, uh, there is also no substitute for change in somebody's mind than explaining mm. to them how it's actually impacting you. And uh, I don't think that's really fair, but I, don't know if I can tell tell you anything different tonight than that. Yeah, and I like I guess one of the big you know we hear so much misinformation about cannabis given out when I hear say the Cannabis Risk Alliance speak, and you hear sometimes Frank Feehan and other people, and it's it's absolutely incorrect information, you know. And if it was, you know, we hear this false information so much in the recent years and fake news and all, like how is that held accountable? You know, like how do we hold people accountable for telling the people, telling the civil servants misinformation and then they're giving advice to the Minister of Health and it's incorrect advice and they won't speak to anybody who's connected with cannabis, whether that's a patient group, somebody like myself that's worked there. There's endless Irish people that are running large cannabis corporations. You know, there's no, there's no lack of expertise out there. And there's just no no engagement. So we have people regulating a product who don't understand the product. And when they speak, it's blatantly obvious. And I, d I don't know where you go, kind of, you know, I guess I don't know where to go. Like, you know, if I do tell my story and hundreds tell their stories, like where, where do we go if there's literally false information being given to our civil servants? Ben? Yeah, Gino, jump in there. Just in relation to the access program and it was highlighted in the health committee a number of weeks ago. Um, and this is a journey that a number of us have started five years ago. Um, and to, I mean, I, I wanted to start positively. We have changed the government's policy in regards to cannabis as a medicine, even though it's extremely restrictive, extremely restrictive. But the law has changed and cannabis now can be used as a medicine. Right. Even though only less than 60, 70 people have access to it via, well, most uh, ministerial license, as of this week, cannabis and uh, medical cannabis products is available on the prescription. Right now, if you said that somebody a number of years ago, especially when we started out in this 2016, I, I said, look, at, well, it's going to take probably a bit longer than that. Right. So we have made progress, even though it's incredibly frustrating incredibly frustrating um, and there's not a week that goes by in fact there's not even two or three days that go by that a family will ring me up and say look at they have a child uh, or somebody if lo um, um, a loved one and they're it, it's, it's, it's hard to hear I have to say it's very difficult to, they, they've run out of road in relation to conventional medicine and they want to at least try medicinal cannabis just try it if it doesn't work look at least they've tried it or if it does work God, you know, it could be transformative. So all that, uh, all that, sorry, my phone's gone up. There's, there's institutionalized resistance against this from the very, very start. And they're happy enough to kind of, just barely happy enough to kind of uh, give people via uh, ministerial license. And that's extremely bureaucratic, right? Extremely bureaucratic. And only a handful of people will get it. Um, so look, we have to keep kind of pushing the, the, the door and that in relation to um, expanding the program. Uh, I think it will. I think it will. I'm, I'm a, 
on, on the internal optimists in relation to this, because if, you, if you're not an internal optimist in here, you will literally go bananas, right? You have to be uh, uh, an optimistic person when it comes to this issue. I think in time, other conditions will be um, uh, um, included. On the basis of commercial reasons, uh, some ways, I think commercial companies have a vested interest in this, and you know uh, they will be lobbying the government to expand uh, this program for other conditions. So that could happen. Um, just in relation to um, oh, where was I going with that? Just in relation to the overall relations, because I try I try not to conflate the two issues, right? Medical and recreation, right? But look at for this for the purpose of this debate, um, and sometimes they do dovetail. Uh, obviously, when we put the bill forward sometime this year, then you know a debate will happen in here and outside the gates of Leinster House, um, and there will be probably a lot of media attention on it and there'll be a lot of discussion. Hopefully it's a rational discussion. There will be a narrative um, in relation to that cannabis is the root of all evil. And um, and that's, that's I'm not trying to trivializing, I'm not going to try trying to trivialize some of um, the concerns that people have. I'm not trying to do that. Um, but we have to take, we can't take that just in isolation. We've got to look at the whole spectrum of, um, de- of prohibition. And when you put all the mitigating circumstances on the table, you put them rationally. Prohibition has been an absolute disaster for people in this country. Disaster. It's, it, is, it, is pu- is, it is punishing people, um, criminalizing people, sanctioning people for the use of cannabis. Now, again, anybody that says with a straight face can actually uh, you know, uh, support that. I don't you know. I'd like to. I like to see them. I'd like to see them you know, supporting the present law around uh, cannabis use. In fact, I'd even go further. The whole, the whole uh, drugs debate has been completely skewed, um, and we need to have a, a, a very, very serious about a debate about regulation of all drugs, uh, because we just we can't win. The war on drugs is unwinnable. It's unwinnable, and we need to have a, a bigger debate. That. But the main thing is that we'll have the the bill. Um, we'll have a debate. And hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, uh, it can pass to the next stage at least. Uh, I know individual members of Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil have come up to me pers- uh, in a personal capacity. They would, su- they would support the issue, but it doesn't work like that. They have to kind of, um, you know, uh, they have to vote with their party. I mean, even um, Carl Crow. Uh, kind of surprised me there two weeks ago at the health committee. He, he, now I don't know if he supports legalisation, but he, he, he said in a rational, he said well, we need to have a different debate about cannabis use, and more of a kind of maybe possibly a regulated system. So look at, um, you know, individual. Uh, that's where I'd be calling now. Individual TDs of parties in government to break ranks uh, with their, well, at least speak out, at least speak out and say, look at, you know, our present policies in relation to cannabis use don't work. Here's a different system. So hopefully that will work. We'll, we'll see. Just to jump in here, I do think, we're, I, I hope that we're reaching a point kind of similar, you know, to the repeal and abortion campaign where it's gone from individuals who are really, really affected by these issues telling their stories for a number of years it's slowly starting to break through into kind of wider conversations. And as Gino just said, you know, with his bill coming up, that will cause debate, regardless of, you know, if people are pro or against it, it's going to cause those conversations. And the Citizens' Assembly, when it does happen, will also cause those conversations. And I really do hope that the more and more we talk about this, the more people will come around and understand kind of the humanity and the dignity that's wrapped up in all these issues, as well as just looking at this as like a drug issue. This intersects so many different things, and it means so much for completely different people, which some people just can't conceptualize at all. And it's only through having these types of conversations that we can get there. And I do think it must be absolutely exhausting for individuals who live this on a day-to-day basis. And all we can do is everyone else to try and push the conversation as best we can to people who normally wouldn't wouldn't speak about these things. But anyway, just to move on, we're going to open up the, the questions now to the audience. Um, 
But just while we're waiting a few questions to, to come in, I'm just hoping if we can run through with all of you guys just very briefly, you know, in like 60 seconds, what would you like to see in the next two years change in this area? So we'll start, Natalie, you've been quiet for a little while, so we'll start with you. I want to see everybody getting stopped, getting criminalized for cannabis consumption and possession. I want those in prison for cannabis related crimes to be released and their records wiped clean. I want uh, people allowed to be to grow their own at home for medicinal or recreational. I want an Irish homegrown indigenous business. I want the revenue of that to be a uh, ring fence for youth projects projects, local community, local services, um, mental health services, addiction services, alcohol services, medical services, hospital clinic services. Like there is great potential. And when I mean figures will astound you if you look into it, like Colorado in the first year after legalization, 4.5 million population, very similar def demographic to Ireland, 700 million in the first year in revenue. What could we do with that money? What housing, what SNAs, what medicine, what scoliosis treatment can we get for people? Like there is a lot of potential to do with this money and stuff that we really need to be done. That right. Those are some great points. I think uh, Miriam, do you want to, to jump in? Yeah, I'm sure. Say, same as uh, similar to Natalie. Um, but I would love to see Ireland lead and do something different. You know, I think this is a plant that really can be a not for profit. Like, I don't think we should be going hard into this plant to monopolize us. You know, it's going to give us a lesson anyway, because quality is going to win. So what I would love to see in the next two years is a complete uh, deregulation, obviously, but grow at home and grow at home would include social clubs. So not for profit social clubs that you could erect, that you could sign up to have somebody else grow for you to keep the cost down. That's if we really want to get rid of the black market. That has to be there. And then retail stores and uh, licensed producers in Ireland and a minimum of a five to 10 year period to allow Irish producers to grow and to really establish themselves before allowing um, any other producers into Ireland to grow. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Gino and then Nessa. What's the question again, Ben? In 60 seconds, what do you want to see change in two years? <laughs> well, it's, I, it's I, a lot I, to I, ask. But... <laughs> I'll do it around two seconds. Look at the law to change. The law to change around cannabis use and consumption. Uh, and once we can change that law, uh, I think it's a progressive law. I think a law that could, you know, that could, that will be popular when you put all the arguments uh, on, on the table. Um, in order to do that, we need to. Well, we need to change attitudes. Um, some in here, uh, there's some very antiquated attitudes to cannabis. Some of them, people you can never change. You just never could change. Well, I think there's a, a groundswell of uh, TDs in the doll that you know are definitely can be won over in relation to uh, um, reform and reform i.e. is regulation and I think when you put all, again you, when you put all the facts on the table um, I think there's a groundswell to change to do something different whether we can do it this time I really don't know I mean it's a numbers game in here as Nessa will tell you you know you need to get 80 plus TDs to support this bill to bring it to the next stage now look at I was surprised in relation to the assisted dying bill I thought literally hadn't got a, hadn't got a chance going to win the next stage it did you know uh, and it's brought her on to a different stage you know hopefully it will get legislated for in the future um, so look at anything is possible everything is possible we will and TD is you know uh, will always have one ear on the out on public opinion and if this becomes popular right things change very quickly just look at repeal just look at repeal you know, if you said to somebody 10 years ago, repeal would have been legislated for, I think people, and, get, and, and getting the support they did in certain sections in, in the doll, I think people would have laughed at you, you know? So look, at things are always possible, but there has to be a will. And once there's a will, there's a way. Is that right? 
And Nessa, do you want to finish up on this before we move on to questions? I mean, I kind of agree with the three pre previous speakers, change the law, all that kind of stuff. I give a particular shout out to developing that cooperative model and that social, you know, that community model. I think that as a bit, you know, that not profit for profit model is really important to me, but also the issue of restorative justice for those who have been criminalized. I think that once we got the law changed, then it's the whole new world where we have to enter into that discussion around restorative justice. And that's incredibly important. And I don't think it's something that should be forgotten in this wider conversation. Like you don't want to leave people who have been more greatly affected by this behind at the end of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's the last thing you want to achieve. I would actually love if we do something like this again in the future, I would love to get Lynn Rowan on to speak because I know she's doing some fantastic work at the moment around restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is, you know, that has to kind of underpin everything. You know, we can't just move forward and leave people who already have been affected behind. Like it has to be a whole systems approach. So thank you all very much for uh, your perspectives and opinions on those. Um, we're still getting a few questions coming in, but if the audience want to keep firing them in, do, because we'll just run through them fairly quickly. Um, if people want to ask a, a specific question to a specific panelist, please include that, because I'm not going to know just from reading. Um, but one of the first ones I see here is from an anonymous attendee. And it talks about, um, you know, setting up institutions around research and research institutes. I know that Task and Uplift recently did a report into, you know, what cannabis changes to regulations could look like in Ireland um, and open to the floor. Um, but do you guys think that potentially we need a lot more targeted research, which you can bring to politicians who are, you know, or, and wider people who might be very skeptical about this whole thing to say, this is the Irish context. Like this is in Ireland. This isn't some study from Canada or whatever. This is here. The is that possible? The, the majority of the responses you get, and Miriam will heard it, Gino, Nessie, you've all heard it. Oh, we need more Irish research. We need more homegrown Irish research. We need more home-based Irish research. You can't do Irish, re Irish research. The MCAP is in, or the people who are on min ministerial licenses, they're not getting reviewed, they're not getting monitored, they're not getting supervised on their medication. So there's nothing informing the system. There is absolutely nothing informing the system, and that goes right across the board. They're asking for more Irish research, but you won't allow it to happen. So, like there's only so much that you can do when you when that's the the answer you get back is they need more Irish research and you can't get there I think if we deregulated the the cannabis that you you'd have an, a number of NGOs who'd like to engage with the research around us more so than they are now but I would totally agree but that's an issue that goes across a whole load of health ish, um, sectors is that we don't really have access and we don't collect disaggregated data which means that we just work in the dark in our health si um, system all the time like even during my research some of the figures I was trying to get it's like oh we don't have them why because we just don't calculate them there, there is no answer, there's no rhyme or reason behind it. And also keep in mind, you can't patent this plant, so there's not quite the appetite there. And similar to what you were saying, Natalie, like you look to the state, right, it's, it's been illegal there, you can't do the research there. If you do do the research, they give you this government grown uh, weed out of Massachusetts that's, you know, have a quick google folks and you'll see that it's, it's not great weed so uh yeah we need to, have to study it and again it comes back to what i said earlier on the call right like my my complaint over the quality of cannabis is being taken by the department of health in holland versus our own department of health so we need them to engage as well like and i guess that comes back to my earlier point who holds people accountable uh, with this you know do you want to come in or will i move on to another question um, no, that report by an, on Tashka, is it? Uh, it's Task and Uplift. Task, sorry. Sorry, Task, yeah, it's very, very good. I recommend anybody to read it. It's a very well um, uh, informed document. And, uh, you know, we can never have enough research. But let's let's get on with it, you know, um, and let's kind of, you know, move things forward. As in, you know, because once something's illegal, and nobody will, very few people will touch with a barge pole. But once it becomes, you know, somewhere in the middle, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, then, you know, 
I presume it's it does it's not as, as taboo as uh, if as something is illegal. So we need to kind of move get, move forward and kind of be mature about uh, uh, about cannabis use, whether it's medical or recreation or whatever you want to kind of whatever kind of form it is. There's a wealth of Irish cannabis knowledge out there, but the majority of them are in Canada, Colorado, or else they're in the illegal market. And like you have to allow the transition from illegal market to legal market because there is a wealth of knowledge out there that will not be available in a regulated market for years to come until people get trained in it. You know, it's already there. You just have to entice those that are away to come home and nurture what you already have. That's a very good point. I must say, I, I, in my experience, for you know, friends going over to Netherlands, places like that, it seems to be relatively common that you come across people working in cafes that are from Dublin. You know, the, the people are there, the expertise is there, it's just being kept in the dark. I mean, those bud tenders in some jurisdictions are getting paid more, more than I'm getting paid at the moment. You know, they make good money because it, it's, a, it's an education. It's almost like a degree. You know, it's, it's there. We just have to nurture it. Um, I'm just going to pop a, a message into the chat here because I came across doing some research a couple of days ago. There's an organization in the UK called Transform Drug Policy Foundation. And they did a report in 2016, which is aimed at policymakers and lawmakers, and it's entitled How to Regulate Cannabis, a Practical Guide. Now, it's quite long. It's 270 pages, and I have not read it. But if there are people who are interested, um, if you search what I've put in there, it might be worth a look, particularly for policy and lawmakers. You know, you might find people who might be interested in excerpts of it, um, if you can find the time to read it, that is. But moving on... Um, Kind of a similar question that was asked here by another attendee is, so as we kind of made clear there, we can't do this research if the whole um, system is still being regulated to such an extent. So someone's asking here, you know, could we just deschedule cannabis, um, which would then, it doesn't necessarily preclude lead regulation, but it frees up the industry from problems around drug laws. So I think this is kind of, you know, a step towards decriminalization in the short term to free up this kind of access, but it wouldn't necessarily be the end goal. Like it would still have to be regulated some way because you don't want illegal market one illegal market products coming in and undercutting price wise the legal market because then that's a disaster. So you still need to have it regulated somewhat. But I think like some jurisdictions have shown that over-regulation and over-cautious regulation can just as well turn into a disaster. I mean, if you're going to put a magnifying glass on this regulation of cannabis, then you're going to ask for more trouble than you already have because the illegal market will be easier to, up to obtain, probably a better product. And like what you'd have to go through to get it in a legal market, it's not worth the hassle. You know, so there, there is a fine balance between totally descheduling it and taking it out of the law and leaving it in the law for the right reasons. Open to the floor if any of the rest of you guys want to jump in. I, I think maybe somebody can maybe correct me on this, but it's possible to reschedule cannabis into schedule two or three. Um, and not legalizing it. I assume that can be done. So you, it's, it's schedule one, you bring it to schedule three. Um, that, could, that could be done. It still doesn't really uh, resolve the issue, uh, but I, I, it's not out of the realms of possibly do, that could be done. Miriam, did you want to come in? I saw you reaching for the mute, I think. Sorry. Um, yeah, I guess, like, of course, we all want to decriminalize, like, I completely agree. The worry is, as Natalie said, like, is the, the blend of the black market. And it's just, it's so important that we have testing, like, that that's going to be everything, right? Like, and even when you look at the magnifying glass around testing, right? Like, what part of the plant are you testing? What part of the room is that plant? Is it the back of the plant? Is it the top of the plant? The bottom? Is going to give you different readings as well but the main thing that we'll be looking for is something called a certificate of analysis 
So every time I would go to buy flour in a legal state or in a, in, legally in Canada, I'd have a certificate of analysis, which would break down my cannabinoid content, different percentages, uh, what pesticides, if any, have been used, has it been irradiated, which is basically like zapped. Uh, it's a, a Canadian thing that we need to look at as well. So, you know, every time you buy a product, like anything else, you want that test and you want that certificate of analysis, whether it's cannabis, beer, your potatoes then inspire, you know, you want to know if they've been sprayed with stuff. So that's, that's my only worry with decriminalization or moving towards that. It's just, is it going to be just basically open playing field for all the black market dealers at the moment, you know? I think unless take anyone else... Right now. Sorry. No, I said it take Anton right now to move things forward though. <laughs> If nobody else wants to jump in now, we'll move on to another question. Okay. Um, I have a question here from, well, question and statement from Oliver Moran, um, which says, in 2018, I launched the Green Party policy on cannabis. I was surprised to see how seriously most news agencies took it and how they asked questions about the economy and social differences it would make. Um, he then goes on to say that someone in a public meeting, stood up at the very back and just shouted legalize it when he was supposed to, to come in to speak. Um, and then skipping on a little bit, the, the question is how do we shift the conversation around the perceptions around the campaign of cannabis and about cannabis? I think it just comes down to education. It's just pure and utter education that's needed. And I, I don't want to use the word ignorance in a bad way, but it is just the it's just ignorance of people of not seeing what's out there and not seeing what's in their face and not knowing stories like Miriam and not seeing reality and opening their eyes. So you do have to bombard them with facts and figures. And it is just about education. I'm just going to jump in quickly because Nessa has to go to vote. I, I have so, to go. And you know, OK, them. yeah. Thank you Sorry, both guys. very much for coming along. It was fantastic to have you here. Um, we'll continue the conversation for a little while longer, Miriam and Natalie, if you guys are willing to stay on. Um, but nonetheless, Gino Thanks and so much, Lassa, thank you so and much for do coming it again. along. Absolutely. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Bye. Have a good night, guys. Cheers. So yes, we can. I will continue just for another 20, 30 minutes if you guys are okay with that and we can call it a night then at that. Yeah, no problem. And um, I guess just to speak to Oliver's point of normalizing it, it's really frustrating because it's like the what comes first, you know, there's adverts out at the moment across Canada. And Natalie, I think you might have shared it too from the Ontario uh, Cannabis Association, which is basically the equivalent of say, if you haven't watched yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. So Ontario, most people know Ontario, Toronto uh, is in Ontario, but it's basically just an ad about, you know, normalizing cannabis and a guy comes in with a bag of like meat of steaks and he was you know the guy looked at him he's like what are you selling me like sketchy meat in a plastic bag for you know wh where'd you get it from and it's just playing on that idea of like people buying their cannabis from an illegal source you're like is this sprayed of fentanyl fingers crossed not and um, so with legalization comes all these ads from not just the government level also from and um, producers of cannabis so i want to normalize it too um, and, you know, like you mentioned earlier, that over regulate, over regulating, regulating us, you know, that's a huge issue in Canada at the moment. Like that was one of my biggest problems when cannabis was first legalized is trying to say, how can I say something is uplifting, you know, without saying it's actually uplifting uh, due to the cannabinoid or the terpene content. You know, we, we kind of moved to like cutting a little video with somebody drinking a fresh glass of orange juice in the morning. And this is what it makes you feel like. But normalizing it is them adverts and it, it it's a lot of it comes down to kind of people sharing their story as well you know while it's illegal it's a blend of people sharing their stories and for companies to start pushing forward with adverts i know we've seen hemp dublin sponsor an elite athlete you see companies starting to step into that space and normalize sports athletes uh, using cannabis and um, so it's that blend of education and getting somebody to bloody google it because we know once people look into cannabis it's undeniable you know from every aspect i do think somewhat related to that actually is there's um i don't think it's it's really broken through the the main media yet but in the uk there's um i'm not going to say a guy he's a character it's kind of a persona 
similar to, you know, Blind Boy here, but there's a guy called Outlaw who's currently going through the court system. I think they're going to announce the, the settlement of the case in a couple of days where it potentially looks like they're going to just win through legal loopholes and police misconduct and various other things, decriminalization. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how that goes because, you know, so much of our news and just general media and culture and things is influenced by the UK. So if the UK changes, that could have a major impact in Ireland that we wouldn't see otherwise, particularly in the older generation, whom would have a lot closer links between family and things like that in the UK um, and here. So that would be quite interesting, I think. And I'm glad to see I wasn't the only one who knew him there. <laughs> there is a lot of people heads. waiting on, on his ruling yeah because there is so many people re relying on the same point mm -hmm. and it is it's argued in a ver like legal wise it, it's a good argument yeah i really don't know what way it's going to land with the judges i'm hopeful and optimistic but you know you can, you can we'll never see. really tell but it, it's smart yeah so yeah just for anyone in the audience who didn't catch that it's outlaw is the name of the guy or the character um, but we'll just move on now to another another few questions. Um, there's a question here from an attendee. I think maybe it's a little bit late now since our two doll reps are gone. The start of the question is just wanted to ask if anyone had an idea of what the doll numbers would be like in support if we disregard party whips, etc. I presume everyone. neither of you guys know. <laughs> I hope everyone, but everyone. We wouldn't know that, I suppose. But then moving on, there's uh, can the government just reject the recommendations from Citizens Assembly? I'm pretty sure they're not binding. It's just yep, recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it really does depend on the political willpower. I know citizens' assemblies are a great, you know, tool of deliberative democracy, and it's kind of the first country in the world to come up with these sort of things, but it really does kick the can down the road a bit. You know, it'll take a year or two for the citizens' assembly to be set up, for them to do deliberation, and then to issue recommendations, which may or may not be taken into account. But it's also who is going to be allowed to speak at the citizens' assembly is, will be the issue. Yeah. Like, is it going to be truly unbiased, or is it going to be tilted towards one side or another? Yeah. You know, and that that is the the main point really of the citizens' assembly. And Miriam was speaking while ago about misinformation without sounding like Donald Trump. Um, but that is a real issue and it is a very prevalent issue and it's often those with the most stubborn ignorant attitude that are the loudest and get listened to and it is very frustrating i've lost many nights sleep and miriam me and miriam would text like no not again have you seen this <laughs> but it, it is like it's frustrating it's, i don't know what else to say except it's frustrating yeah i remember a couple of months ago seeing an article in the paper of you know cannabis is the gravest threat to the mental health of young people um and i was incensed afterwards because you know as we say people use these things to self-medicate to kind of escape for a while sometimes like absolutely cannabis is not the gravest threat to young people's mental health it's things like housing jobs all these sort of problems so it definitely is like perspectives in, in some sectors are completely looking the wrong direction. They're looking for problems instead of symptoms to problems and things like this. So it's the media is responsible for a lot of the scaremongering. I mean, we've had scaremongering since the 70s, since yeah. the 60s, since the 50s about cannabis, like Reefer Madness, terrible black and white movie. Don't watch it. But like there was a one example is the potency of cannabis. Mm. And Dana Larson on Twitter had done a fantastic deep dive into media reports on potency of Twitter, on media point of THC, sorry. And what did he say? He said, according to the news in America, THC limits in marijuana are 67,200 times stronger than they were in the 60s. So according to all the in 80 years of potency reports that the media have published, according to the published media, it's 67,200. I mean, like it hasn't got stronger. Yes, it's more concentrate. Miriam would know more about this than I would. But like, think of it like alcohol. You have a 5% beer or a 40% whiskey. You're not going to drink them the same. Why? Because you know not to drink them the same because you're educated or you learned your lesson very young. 
like and that has to be the same in terms of cannabis like we can't say no concentrates we can't say this like it's education and it's the media have to put out the proper facts and not this sensationalized headlines that they do put out yeah and um, not Lila, when i when you know when i hear that as well like it's just the moment someone starts talking about that it's just so clear that there's a lack of understanding what cannabis is because the potency or the thc percentage it does not equal the effect you know and if again it comes back to this public safety you know uh, a 10% THC with a certain arrangement of terpenes, it's going to give you a very different effect. And, you know, one thing I used to talk about during, my, during the education talks is that when you were consuming from Whistler, which was grown in living organic soil versus something that was grown in rock wool, not really minded as much, it's a different experience, you know? So it's, it's, it's the, not just the THC potency, you know, it's the terpenes, it's the way it's grown, it's the type of soil it's grown in that's going to give that effect. And, that, I think that's where the frustration comes from so many of us cannabis um, advocates is that we are really passionate about public safety. And I am like the bizarre thing is I'm completely aligned with the Cannabis Risk Alliance. I don't want you to consume in cannabis in Greg. I don't want that to happen to anyone young. I don't want any adult having a bad experience with cannabis. So we all want the same goals. It's just how we get there. Right. I, I, you know, it's just laughable that prohibition is going to be the way there. And um, so. Uh, yeah, the whole, the whole potency in the THC thing, it's just, it's off the wall and it just, it, it lacks an understanding of how cannabis interacts with our body, you know. They kind of have this blunt or this joint in their head and they completely mi miss that, like, I use a patch and I use topicals and so, uh, yeah, it's it's frustrating and that's why we need, we need to be able to kind of question these people and I would love to have, you know, one of them come on one of these calls so you can actually have a conversation and push back on the data, you know. Next one, Ben, now to get, to get somebody on that we can debate. Absolutely. That would be great. <laughs> I do think, actually, that's that's a, a real kind of niche, maybe, in, in Irish media circles is, you know, like just daytime radio talk show stuff. There's been some fantastic interviews, um, but they just disappear afterwards you know unless you know to look for them it's impossible to find them again um but there's a couple of radio shows i think uh red fm neil Niall prendeville he's done a few mm -hmm. some of them good some of them bad but nonetheless he's having those conversations you know so it'd be great if we could start just getting that sort of because we really would be surprised the amount of people that would hear those during the day just leave the radio on in the car whatever um, and that's a great way of just bringing those conversations to people. And generally, it is a case of, you know, someone calls in and they're like, oh, I'm totally for it. I'm totally for it. And then the next person says, oh, it's fucking awful. You know, this is terrible. So it does does sometimes get a, a good argument across. But nonetheless, um, there's a question here from one of the attendees. I don't know how much. I definitely have no idea about this stuff. But as an EU member, is it realistic to expect that EU companies in the sector would have full access to the Irish market or can the Irish market be restricted to domestic companies? I don't know. Do you guys know around this kind of company law stuff? Because to the best of my knowledge, we can't just say, you know, this is just Irish, like no one else is allowed. We can't stop products produced and lawfully marketed in the European Union to stop coming into Ireland. Legally, Ireland has to leave those products in. That's not happening at the moment because in the CBD hemp aspect of cannabis, legally produced products in Europe that's getting imported into Ireland is resulting in people having their businesses raided. So, you know, EU law will work when it suits them. Yeah. You know, and I think if, if they really wanted a industry of a homegrown industry, then they could. And at an EU level, this is drug. So at an EU level, like they're, they haven't really gone as far as endorsing a regulated market, but like EU countries are still flexible enough to do what they want within the space once they combat smuggling and cross-border issues. So like there would be two aspects of play in terms of the legal market and the legal market and can we differentiate and I think Europe will be like Ireland at the moment it's the horse will be bolted out of the the the, the stable before they actually get around to it you know mm. yeah and I think even in terms of any sort of European policy stuff you know you're trying to get 28 
27 member states to agree on something. It's going to be so watered down by the time everyone agrees that it will be effectively useless. Now, give it years and eventually start to move. But Well, like we have Italy, we have Malta, we have Uruguay, we have uh, Holland. Like Switzerland just announced people. they're going having a referendum on it in a few yeah. days. Or yeah. they announced it a few days ago, I think, did they? Mm. Yeah. So it is moving. Yeah. yeah. So I I suppose... I'm just afraid that Ireland will get left behind as always and we'll be the last ones rather than the first. I mean, we brought in the smoking ban when Europe thought we were crazy and look at the ripple yeah. effect that had, you know. if I think if such a small country like Ireland makes a, a firm, hard stance on it now and make our own model at it, we can show off and be peacocks to the rest of Europe with this wonderful industry that we've made and nurtured and look how fabulous we're doing. You know, it's... There, there is a real opportunity there, but nobody's paying attention. Mm. Sorry, now I just have a quick glance through. This is interesting now um, from Cormac McKay. Um, there's loads of old laws still on the books that the Gardaí no longer enforce. Why can't the guards take the position like the Dutch police did? The Gardaí are a problem as well upholding outdated laws. We kind of mentioned this with discretion. Um, and, you know, there definitely is certain aspects of society that are a lot more relaxed with this kind of thing. Like when you talk to a lot of politicians, like they do often, you know, there's maybe, maybe it's not a case of like, yeah, we should legalize it, but it's kind of like, yeah, we should, like Carl Crow said during the MCAP debate, you know, we should be having these wider discussions. And as was pointed out, you know, civil service and, and some of those like, the, the more permanent systems within governance often hold us back. And even we saw with like, you know, the announcement that GSOC was going to get more power to, to investigate guardy abuse and the guards freaked out at this. So, you know, is there a way to do either of, you know, like maybe in different countries or anything, like how do we actually change the policing aspect without, you know, having to completely change the whole system? Like, is there a way? Like you, you have something that's known as de facto decriminalization, which would be very similar to what Holland has now. So in the Dutch model, cannabis is still an illegal drug, but it's unenforced. Tolerated. It's tolerated. It's still illegal. The, the cops can still arrest you on the street and convict you for it, but they haven't done it in donkey's years. So like that can be done. Obviously, it can be done absolutely anywhere. But again, there is so many issues in Irish society that that discretion, again, will be only used for a certain sector of society. So like the way to how to combat that. I need a crystal ball. I really couldn't tell you how you're going to combat the issues that you have in policing in Ireland. I think like stigma comes down to a lot of it, a lot of bias, a lot of perception, a lot of negative stereotyping. Um, but like these reactions and these attitudes, they're they're not born, they're taught. Yeah. You know, like somebody's not born thinking a certain way. Like these are taught negative, biased, judgmental attitudes. We have to have the discussion of whether that negative aspect of policing is coming from outside sources or is it actually inbred in the police itself? locker room discussions going on that should not be tolerated that's only encouraging it and enforcing it you know th this needs to be nipped across the bud in all of society not just the police force like this is something that everybody needs to address like you you can't use words to describe people who use drugs you can't you know call travelers certain words there's a good reason why you can't do that anymore and why you can't, because it's not socially acceptable. It's not the right things to do anymore. Certain members of society need to learn that from people to guards, to politicians, to the Pope himself. I hear my name. I think that, yeah, I, th <laughs> I think um, the saddest thing about cannabis I find, you know, is that normally the call only comes true when somebody's sick. I and mean, I think that's the saddest thing. And it's, Last you resort. know, endemic in our it's last resort. The dogs on the street know the cannabis helps as last resort. You know, when people get death, they come, so they know, like they know, because 
Um, you will always hear people at certain stages and certain conditions wonder, will cannabis help? Can we use cannabis? And that's usually when the phone calls start coming through. You know, how do we apply? How do I apply for an MCAP? How do I apply for a minute? And it's it's sad because they've never stood up before or never recognized it. So I just, I think it's an open door. We just need to kick it through. Like everything is on our side, facts, science, the stories, the people, the industry, it's all coming and it's all going to come quick to Ireland. And whether it comes, as you said, Ben, through the UK and they legalize, because if they legalize, I can't see us not following suit in some way. You know, over in the States, it's the Democrats get it through and it legalizes in America. You know, that's, you know, then you're going to go Canada, America. We're not going to be waiting. You know, they're going yeah. to push through and see it then as a as an industry. You know, I think there's 33 states now that are pushing through for full legalization, wow. not just medical around the edge. So I think federal um, legalization in the states is going to yeah. create such a huge shift in perceptions and priorities yeah. across the world. It is. It's. It's yep. going to be a benchmark. Mm. Yeah, I just hope we don't react because you know if Kerry Gold is selling across California, you can only imagine you know what Irish grown cannabis is going to do over there. Yeah, that's so so true. positive. Yeah, it's coming. Like the only positive thing is that this is one hundred thousand percent coming. Full legalization is coming. It's just you know, a matter because, of time. It's just a matter of time and how it's done. I just, yeah. I hope we don't get done over in Ireland because that's what it feels like at the moment is that Irish industry is going to be done over, you know. Yeah. But and if even, we all stay together, medical and rec. Yeah, 100%. Sorry, but yeah. Even, even from, you know, you could say a, a cynical youth point of view that we already, now this is a bit of a generalization, but kind of sell ourselves out to multinationals. And I'd know that there was... Was it 2017, 2018? There was a couple of cannabis companies from, was it the States? Maybe it was Canada who, who kind of yep. set up um, a branch here in hopes that they would be the first ones when something did happen. I think yep. they've left since, but yeah, clearly like, right. mm. tell us a little and bit Aurora. about that if you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, I worked for Aurora, but I worked on the recreational side versus the medical side, um, but was, you know, aware of Europe. But yeah, Tilray started here, like, I mean, when I first joined, like, that was the dream. It was like, can, because I had left Ireland, so I was like, yeah. well, can I go and try and bring cannabis back to Ireland? Now, they've turned out to be different companies, and I thought, like, you know, it is what it is when a company is floated on the stock exchange. They only need to make money and that is what it is. But when they were coming here, like my experience anyway, is that it was done in a very positive way. They were passionate about access for patients. They weren't seeing it happening here. We would do the same in Canada and America as Irish companies. And there was a genuine, you know, obviously they wanted to make money, but there was also a genuine push for patients back then. You know, the share price has gone down a lot of these companies now that it's got a lot more doggy dog and, you know, it needs to make money. Um, but back then, you remember even with Aurora, you know, they were helping Billy up north. They were giving him free cannabis and, you know, even working in the recreational legal space. You know, the company I work for Aurora and Tilray, a lot of them were doing it. You know, they were pushing for cannabis amnesty and they're pushing to get the records expunged so people could travel. And that passion was there, that social responsibility. It's been pulled back now because the share prices have all gone off a cliff. But at the core is really is a goodwill you know to, to bring cannabis here i don't think they'll come back i i just don't i you know financially like it's just not going to make sense for them to come into ireland for 100 patients 500 patients i don't even know if it's worth their while for them for 500 you know like they'll have a number unfortunately i didn't get that information what the number is but uh you know like any company they'll have a number of what makes sense you know yeah. but we don't we don't need us and that's I can't say that loud enough. You know, we welcome trade, but we absolutely do not need it. Yeah. We can have this here. And that's what's going to create the quality either way, you know. And it's like they lose the, you know, when they when you think of say the Department of Health and they're making regulations, even if you just think of cannabis as a plant, the idea of shipping a plant across the Atlantic, you're obviously going to lose some of its quality and some of its efficacy as a medicine. So either way, it kind of doesn't make much sense. There, like there, there is still lobbying ongoing like what the motivations behind the those be those that are doing the lobbying is 
I couldn't tell you, but like the, there, there is a certain type of lobbying that's there and it's, it's almost, I don't really know what word to call it. It's like, it's like something wearing a cloak. They're lobbying for the side of cannabis that's synthetic. So you have synthetic CBD products are on the shelf because they don't contain a minute trace of THC, they're legally permitted. Organic CBD isn't because it contains minute traces of THC. So like there already is that divide in the little market that we have there. Now there is a synthetic product that's allowed and an organic product that it isn't. And that lobbying is there. Like the, there are companies out there who want to come in and make synthetic cannabis, synthetic THC, synthetic CBD. And they're the ones with money, I'm afraid. You know, and sometimes those with the bigger wallets do get listened to an awful lot more and they are an awful lot louder. And I think that's the, the issue is that we can't leave the other side of the argument go unheard of. Yeah, I, I am. I, I do. Um, I am worried that, you know, there are certain parties in government who have always been in government who, if they did decide to move on this decision, it would be how can we get something from this? You know, who can get us, who can we get to scratch our back from this decision? Um, now, that being said, if that happens, fine. You know, it would be great to get a move in the right direction as long as there is stipulations for grow at home or, you know, social clubs that people don't have to be reliant on private businesses to produce because then your black market will remain. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a place in every market for synthetic products. I mean, sure. Not know, solely. Can, not yeah. solely. Like they have their place in the market for certain things, maybe medicine, maybe this, maybe that. But you, you can't allow the other side of the market and the other side of the, the consumer base to not be allowed to grow at home. You know, it's I really don't hope don't hope that that will happen. I really don't want that to happen. Yeah. And right. the grow at home was really like it did boom in Canada. And it was, it's interesting just to keep in mind kind of like how people are taking advantage of the cannabis plant. So the grow at home in Canada was actually lobbied by some of the larger companies to lower the amount of plants that were being grown because too many people were growing. So it's nearly as a society, we need to be like, why, why are we legalizing cannabis? You know, and it needs to be that we want quality and lower price and that grow a home has, has to be the foundation for anything moving forward or we're just going to be stuck in the circle. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. So we are approaching half nine now. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up. But just my last question to both of you would be for people who are interested in this, you know, are there organizations within Ireland that maybe people can help or like go to information for or, you know, help move the conversation a bit? There, there's loads of small ones like there's loads of not small because they're big because any sort of pro cannabis industry is big in Ireland but there's patients for safe access there's Miriam help me out because I'm going to forget <laughs> there's the major yeah. smoke up like they organize a lot of protests yeah. Um, what else there's so many more like there's uh, Alicia Maher there's follow her story Vera Toomey yeah. follow uh, her yeah, story yeah lots of small ones yeah Vera Toomey yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like the, there's, there's a hashtag cannabis reform Ireland. You'd find the majority of people posting and information up under that. There's a Facebook group as well. I've only been on it once or twice, but I, I know they, they do meet up every Tuesday. I think the Cannabis Activist Alliance. Yeah. Um, seems to be just great. Yeah, great group of people, you know, genuinely trying to make a change. So I think if people want to actually do stuff, they seem to be a great group that they organize different things. Um, and speak out yourself you know if I can say one thing to people speak to five people this week about cannabis or this month you know like we're the voices of this like if you're at your kitchen table or you're with friends and they're speaking incorrectly about cannabis or maybe it's just you coming out of the closet and saying yeah do you know what I run marathons and I also smoke cannabis you know that's okay or I use the topical so it's about coming out of the closet to our nearest and dearest as well because that's really what's going to normalize it across society for us and that's why these talks and these this kind of stuff is important because it's the start of the conversation you know you're able to say oh geez Gino Kenny was talking about this in the dial or Nessa was talking about it or I watched this conversation last night and 
it's a conversation starter because it is often very hard to walk into your grandmother and go here do you know anything about cannabis but you know it's something to start the conversation and that's all that needs yeah that's all you need is just a conversation starter absolutely yeah. i would agree I, again you know making the parallels to repeal and and that movement and campaign i think that was in large part one of the things that really pushed that kind of conversation in the right direction was the amount of people who just went home and had conversations with people that normally they wouldn't have on such emotive topics. Um, yeah. And it really can make a world of difference. And it can be very hard to see that, you know, in, in like the short term, you might feel shit afterwards or it might be a little bit complicated and you don't see something positive coming out of it. But on a much wider level, you know, if more and more people do that, the critical mass will be going in the right direction. Um, and again, as I said at some point earlier, you know, I think a lot of these issues do come down to kind of humanity, dignity, respect, and just, you know, are we going to treat people like adults? Are we going to allow people to have these choices themselves? Because people will use cannabis anyway. You know, are they going to use it safely or unsafely? And we do have the power to change those things if enough of us call for it. But anyway, to, to end on that note, I want to thank you both yeah. very much for coming along. It was a fantastic discussion. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do this again in the near future. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for having us on. Thanks yeah, very much, guys. Enjoyable as well, right? And thanks okay. to all the attendees thanks who are all. here also. Good yeah. night, everyone. Mind thanks, yourselves. Thanks for in the background. Bye. <laughs>